Welcome everyone, and uh, thank you to our host and organizers of today's conference. Uh, the previous two panels have been very thought-provoking, and I think uh, highlight the issues that we face in this um, <clears throat> post-conflict, ongoing conflict, uh, efforts to try to find where does development fit in to the chaos that's happening all around the world, uh, caused by various means, and uh, with an emphasis on the Middle East. Because I think any of us that are working in the field and working in very specific parts of the world, we can look at our area as what we've learned, our strengths, our weaknesses, what's succeeding, what's failing, in the political dynamics, cultural dynamics, but it's going to be different everywhere. And what, what I would like to do is try to, as moderator of this panel, which has also <coughs> two very experienced and uh, excellent panel members, is try to keep a focus on the fact that we're dealing with very specific situations that are right now a growing tragedy being Syria and Iraq, even though there are many tragedies in other places, north and south, east and west, and there are many reasons. Some are natural, some are man-made. Um, but I've also been thinking as I listen to each panel, what are the commonalities that tie, except for the solutions? Solutions come based upon issues of how you do your interventions within a cultural context of where you are. It's based upon the relationships with people within a specific geographic area. And their, and their relationships are shaped maybe over centuries. So to come in as an outsider is no easy task. Uh, it's, it's also shaped by your resources. It costs a lot to intervene and it costs a heck of a lot to do development. And it takes a lot, of, you know, a lot of resources on our level if you're doing police actions. So if you, it's a lot of times, it's a choice where you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't when you have a limited budget that you have to manage. This, this particular panel also deals with the role of private sector within all of this and the relationship as I read into this, between the NGO community, non-governmental, and the business sector, private sector, whether it's local or international. And for the um, non-governmental organizations to be kind of a bridge between the governmental sectors and the private sector that has resources that can supplement. Um, we deal with a lot of biases, a lot of prejudices, and a lot of lessons that are not very well learned as we go from one chaotic region to another, or even different countries within a region, or even in different tribal sectors within a particular country. It always varies. The, as moderator. Um, I'm looking at where I see a gap. And that gap often is in communication and it's also in information. How are we shaping solution based upon adequate and accurate information? One of the things that I think we see today is that although there's lots of social media the conventional media is more and more limited. There's more restrictions. There's more fear that if someone's going into an area, they will be targeted. So their bosses are going to be more reluctant to be sending people that could wind up with their head chopped off or tortured or whatever the case may be. Um, also, there's a lot of hearsay. Because anybody can do, say anything on social media. And who's to know what's true and what isn't true? 
whether it's done on purpose or if it's just done with someone with a lot of passion who has an idea or they have a perception, rightly or wrongly so. Um, I think an important role, and that's not the, the panel, this is just one element, of those who are on the ground, those who are in touch with the local communities or displaced communities, is to try to get a pulse of the situation and have enough accurate information that you can actually, when we're talking about, I, uh, I think, uh, Chris, you talked about having multi-year funding. How do you know what your budget is? And when you're faced with growing numbers of of uh, just internally displaced people or refugees, however you want to categorize someone, it costs a lot of money to feed people. And how do you make a budget for feeding when that number is constantly growing? You know, and in a lot of cases, there's no way you're going to build an economy because it's too damn dangerous, or there's no way in an unstable situation that you can create the conditions to be able to build out livelihood. And then, as other people pointed out, if you get the displaced people working in an environment, it causes a hardship for the local people. And we, I think all of us who have worked in the field have seen a little bit of all of that over our careers. It's really tough to know what's the right thing to do and what is the right thing to advocate for. And then one more factor when it comes to the issues of peace building. Sometimes you have a civil war situation and you can use mediation, social psychology, this, this, this. Other times, you have people to thrive on chaos. And it is, their, it is their objective to create as much hardship, as much suffering, and as much destruction as possible because their idea is not so much to control but to destabilize. So we have to ask, who are the people behind the destabilizers? And if we don't ask that question, because sometimes if you're the UN, it could be some of your prominent members. If you're a government, any place in the world, it can be somebody who has been an ally. So if I'm, for instance, Syria, Iraq, thinking about particular groups that have risen during the past few years, somebody's paying for them. Who is it? We seldom see any discussion on who are their paymasters. Now, if I was the Taliban and I had Pakistan backing me, okay, I'd look at Baluchistan and say, oh great, this is where the opium that's grown is processed. I have to ask who's processing the opium, who's selling it, who's distributing it, and we get to part of the root of the issue. Okay? When I'm talking about ISIS and who is has the most at stake in making sure that these people have what they need, I can't make an accusation right here because the Middle East is not exactly my place. I have a pretty good idea though. And I don't see enough people that are following up and challenging those who may be the ones that have the most to gain by the suffering of their neighbors. And as NGOs in private sector, we can cry a river, or we can spend gazillion dollars on sacks of wheat and rice. Its money's going to run out. At some point, there will be humanitarian fatigue, donor fatigue, and we're going to have to just sit and watch people die. So my recommendation is that we have to ask who are the paymasters of the chaos and deal with them. And, and NGOs, even though we are not, uh, you know, GI Joes, we can at least ask questions because it seems there's a gap in media reporting. And there's a gap in governmental reporting because governments don't like to hear things that they don't want to hear. And that includes the UN. Or it could be prominent donors or member nations. That's just reality. <clears throat> <clears throat>
<coughs> now, on our panel today, um, we have two very, very good, <coughs> experienced uh, members of diplomatic and also security um, professional experience. Uh, Michael Gijic uh, has been an army officer. He's just written a book on organized crime and how that fits into the destabilization of a lot of parts of the world. He's, besides being a soldier, he's also worked with diplomats. And um, it's good because you have to find the balance between diplomacy sometimes and security. Everybody's got their turf and it's not easy because uh, everyone doesn't want to surrender what they feel is the right the right solution or just covering their backside so that they don't look bad. So I, I really have to Michael's on the panel because he's had to deal with that stuff. Uh, we also have David Weiss, who has experience on many, many facets of international relations and economics and also humanitarian work in dealing with these very difficult issues in places where you need a lot of money if you're going to succeed because there are so many people whose lives are topsy-turvy. And um, I just think it's, it's this has been a wonderful event with really good people on each panel with a whole panorama of experience. And um, I'm very honored and happy to be with the speakers on this panel as well. And I will turn the microphone over to Colonel Gigi. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to also thank Chris Olshack for this terrific opportunity because he's aware that I just completed a work uh, that sponsored by the Alliance for Peace Building in the U.S. Institute of Peace. The title is Overlooked Enemies of Peace, Subduing Illicit Power Structures. And so I'm going to speak about that, and it's about peace implementation. So if we're talking about the Middle East in a post-2015 world, um, we can hope and anticipate that at some point there will be peace processes in places like Yemen, Syria, Libya. Uh, back when I was a, a few years ago, when I was a graduate student, Freddie Clay had a book called Every War Must End. And the point was that you needed a strategy to figure out how to get to the end of the war. Well, that was about interstate conflict. But the same thing is pretty much true about internal conflict. When those wars end, will we have a strategy that works for peace implementation. And our success rate hasn't been terrific. Kofi Annan in 2005, uh, in uh, Broader Freedom, it was, wrote that 50% of the conflicts that the UN intervenes in revert to conflict after five years. Well, that's if the mission doesn't collapse first by overlooking some of the critical spoilers, like we almost did in Sierra Leone and Haiti. But what's not in that statistic is the frozen conflict. So the ones that have gone on for 20 years, like Bosnia or almost 20 years in DRC, and futility, uh, it doesn't generate a lot of support around the world for the peacekeeping enterprise. So as John Filson said, we can learn, we can anticipate, we can do better the next time. So that's basically what I want to talk about based on the work that I've done anticipating a peace process in peace processes in Syria, Libya, Yemen, can we set them up for success? So that's what I want to talk about. Uh, it was going to help me with the slides here. So I'm going to frame the discussion by putting forward my precepts, one of the principles that, that guide, and I think guide really all, all of our interest in this activity. But then the things that we overlook. And then finally, the answer to the so what question, well, how do we address these critical issues? So for the next slide, assumptions and axioms. 
Um, I added to the fragile state focus that you have here the failed, of course, that's when the fragile state collapses in, into conflict. That's when the international community is compelled to intervene with the peace mission. But I think in many, if not most, of the current cases, what's behind the fragility, what's behind the conflict, is really the criminalized nature of the regime. How did the Arab Spring start in Tunisia? It was because the Ben Ali regime rendered the population humiliated and hopeless. There were no prospects if you weren't part of the patronage structure. Um, so that certainly was what, what happened in Libya and Syria. Uh, people rose up peacefully against the regime because there weren't opportunities for them to, to look forward to a livelihood in the future. Um, and certainly the other conflict that we focus on today is in the Ukraine obviously was precipitated by the corrupt nature of the oligarchy there as well. So criminalized states are the source of fragility and conflict. And, and even though today we're thinking in terms of great power conflict with Russia back to the, the Cold War era, um, really at the heart of that conflict was state fragility, weak states, not strong states, as being a source of great conflict for the international community. How do you deal with it? Well, uh, we've demonstrated pretty well in Afghanistan and Iraq that we don't really have a solution doing it unilaterally. <clears throat> and I'll mention some of the mistakes that we made uh, that are replicated in other cases as well. But, so we need a fix in what you call in your write-up, uh, Chris, your comprehensive and coordinated multilateral strategy. Uh, that's obviously what we need to do, but focus on what? And that's what I want to talk about. So the bottom line in the constant conclusion of the book, I mentioned overlooked enemies of peace, is the biggest spoiler of peace missions and stability operations are criminalized power structures. So I want to Describe what that means, next slide, uh, and then give you just a couple examples and then get into how do we deal with that. The essence of the regime is that its, so its access to power is driven <coughs> by access to illicit wealth. This could be a great economy, whether it's looting of natural resources, uh, the evasion of customs taxes, uh, rent seeking in the government, or the black market activities of trafficking in humans or drugs, etc. Money laundering. So that's how power is obtained. There's a political economy of conflict, essentially. The um, access to illicit wealth may be the motive, or it could be the means to redress grievances. Either greed or grievance, it could be both uh, simultaneously. What we tend to overlook is that the state itself is the problem, we are quite happy to identify an insurgency, and, and which don't have any other sources of revenue. They have to generate the revenue to support themselves through some form of illicit activity. But what we tend to overlook is that the state itself, uh, that's the foundation for its power. And part of the reason we overlook it is that it's not on any organizational chart. It's not the formal economy. It's the underground economy. It's not the formal power structure. It's the informal structures that we need to identify. So that's one of our, I think you mentioned, that we need to have information. One of the questions we need to ask and the answers we need to provide are those not obvious sources of wealth and power. Next slide. So just very quickly, there's 18 uh, missions that the Afghanistan and Iraq are not peace missions, they're stability operations, but the rest are UN missions. There's 18 there. The ones that are underlined are in the book, which I just, I just mentioned. But I want to highlight um, four, of, four others that Steve Stedman, you're familiar with the term spoiler, that was provided to us by Steve Stedman in 1997. And he looked at Angola, Jonas Savimbi, two cases in Cambodia, Hun Sen, and the Khmer Rouge, 
but I want to talk about Rwanda because we think of Rwanda as an ethnic conflict. But what really was at the heart of it was that a northern Rwandan tribe, if given the nickname Kazu, felt that their 30-year grip on power and their ability to ex exploit access to wealth in Rwanda was threatened by the Arusha courts. That's why they trained the inner Hama, which Romeo Dallaire figured out. He knew that they were t teaching the inner Hama to butcher people with machetes. Who did they go after first? It was modern Hutus, not Tutsis. So it was just unspeakable avarice, not ethnic conflict, that was at the heart of the genocide in Rwanda. We overlooked it. And we tend to brand conflicts, whether it's in the Balkans, or even when we think of Syria today as sectarian, or some kind of ethnic strife, when in fact, at the root, in many cases, is the criminalized power structure. So we need to stop overlooking it. That's the first uh, solution. Next slide. So uh, here uh, is the answer to the so what question. Uh, three things. There's probably going to either be a void in the rule of law or the, the regime that's in power exploits the legal system as if it's a repressive apparatus of the state. If we think of uh, Yemen and Libya, this is there probably isn't any functioning system uh, in place. In Syria, it's not a capacity problem, it's how it's used. Uh, the options that the UN and the European Union have for dealing with this really provides a false dichotomy. There's sort of a, conceptually, we're too constrained and limited. We either go in and take over entirely with executive authority, or we simply go in in a substitution mode and build capacity. And even if in a mission like the Central African Republic, most recently, about a year ago, the mission the mandate was provided. And I was at a, at a meeting with David Brown, who was a leading US envoy at the time, and he described CAR as a Hobbesian state of nature. There was no legal system. The mandate, however, the mandate for the UN was to support a non-existent legal system. And in fact, what's happened, and what I'm proposing, is an intermediate option. We need to expand our repertoire between those two, if you will, extremes. An intermediate option where we go in and create hybrid justice institutions, international and local, Judges and prosecutors and a police unit that's able to effect an arrest. In other words, you need to have the whole legal spectrum covered, obviously, incarceration as well, uh, with both internationals and locals working together. And that is, in fact, what has happened in CAR. They are establishing now a special court. Um, that's one of the ways of overcoming, and of course in, in the Middle East, this is going to be a big question. Uh, when we, if the UN and some other intervening body goes into those conflicts. The second issue I want to highlight is that we, the US especially, but, but also the international community, the UN, when we do intervene, we tend to think of building up the security sector, especially as our exit strategy. If we can build the police and the military, then we can lead. And we do not give equal primacy to developing the accountability structures. And the real threat, especially in the case of a criminalized power structure, is politicization and criminalization of the security forces. And if we don't give equal primacy to accountability, that is in fact what will happen. Well, we, won't be, we run that risk. Or if we don't address it, we're stuck for years because we can't then do it. In, uh, I, in February of 2012, I had the chance to go to a conference with the Syrian National Council and the Kurdish National Council 
to plan for the post Assad transition. And I mentioned uh, the fact that the international community never thinks about what to do with the intelligence community when we have a DER program. And boy, did that provoke a lengthy discussion. I am not an expert at all in Syria, but I learned that they have a 500,000 person intelligence apparatus. That's not going away. Uh, we talked about it in the context of a quote, post Assad regime, but what's likely is to be uh, the regime stays, it's just that Assad goes. The intel apparatus is going to be there. And that, those are the people who do the work. Those are the ones who are responsible for the use of violence against whoever their rivals are. So, account of the capacity for asserting some accountability over their conduct uh, and the accountability structures need to be developed. The third item is that the UN has, as Chris said, an allergy to intelligence. They have, in, they have created joint mission analysis centers, but their remit is strategic intelligence, the region, the big picture, not tactical intelligence, nothing actionable. I had a chance to talk with the UN panel, I led an independent panel on peace operations. I won't mention the name because I think it might have been Chatham House rules, but we had a, a session of protection of civilians. And he began by saying, well, you know, you really need to lower expectations because the UN doesn't have the resources to protect civilians everywhere. People are going to get killed and we're going to be held responsible and, you know, we need to lower expectations. And so I raised my hand and they said, well, that depends on what your strategy is. If you're playing whack-a-mole and they kill somebody here, then we try to go respond and they kill somebody there and we go respond to that. You're, you're never going to win. That's a losing strategy. If you use intelligence to identify what the network is that's behind that, and then gather the intelligence and, and actually criminal intelligence so that you can actually hold them accountable in a court of law, then you can dismantle those structures without having to protect everybody everywhere. And actually, you may have enough intel to be able to be on the spot uh, and, and disrupt a planned operation. Uh, much more effective if you have tactical intelligence. And, and by the way, the discussion uh, that uh, Robert Steele about open, open source clearly needs to be exploited. Uh, professional police use human sources as well, and technical means. Uh, all three should be exploited in order to be able to conduct criminal intelligence-led policing. In fact, the UN uses intelligence. And no, no professional military is going to go and put themselves at risk for force protection reasons they gather intelligence. Police, at least some UN police, or professional, they'll pay out of pocket and pay informants. It happens. It's just that it's not regular. So it needs to be brought out of the dark and made part of uh, practice. Okay. So the agenda for action. Uh, as you probably were thinking in terms of getting a mandate for some kind of hybrid justice institution, when in fact uh, permanent members of the Security Council are themselves criminalized power structures that may not be uh, the most <coughs> likely route uh, for, for, to get that. I wouldn't uh, rule it out, but I would suggest that the way to do this, and this is why I'm so glad to have the chance to talk to you, is that we need to plant in the seed when negotiations take place for Syria, for Libya, for Yemen, that there should be, in the peace agreement, if you're violating the mandate, if you're killing civilians, or, and I would add a list of other crimes against the mandate, just against the mandate, not enforcing any other laws in the country, just 
if you're committing a crime against the mission, there needs to be some recourse, some legal mechanism to use. Theft of international systems. I would throw in grand corruption as well, because if you're stealing your money so that we can pay for all of your services and, and the requirements in your country, that's not a very smart proposition either. Espionage against the mission, uh, trying to suborn and intimidate uh, local hires. Uh, those kinds of things demonstrate that whoever's doing it is someone who's uh, trying to obstruct the peace process. So, at any rate, uh, that should be made a part of the negotiations, especially if it is the state itself, as in Syria, that is not trustworthy. Uh, the opposition groups who are involved in negotiating that should have that notion in their arsenal. Um, the, as the focus of this discussion is on having a coordinated strategy, who can lead that effort to make accountability equal primacy with capacity building so we don't repeat the past mistakes that we've made? The UN should take that lead. But to give it teeth, to give it traction, we have to be able to properly measure. Is there effective accountability? Are our policies and are our programs helping to increase the capability? The indicators that uh, the New Deal, which uh, this discussion is focused on, have there are useful indicators <coughs> there, but it doesn't get down to the level <coughs> they have their vertical, horizontal, and diagonal types of accountability that need to be measured but especially whether the civil society and independent uh, mechanisms of accountability are functioning. And in the indicators that they have in the New Deal, no, there's nothing about, uh, there is impunity, but not as for police, individual police, but not for the power structure itself. Uh, so if we could come together and, and agree, donors in the UN, Okay, this is how we're going to measure accountability. It makes it possible then for us to go into one of these next interventions with the armed with the toolkit. And finally, uh, and I think there's at least hope that the UN might adopt the use of criminal intelligence led policing because we had the opportunity to present our ideas in March to the UN panel. Uh, Amira Hawk, the vice chair. And uh, Andy Hughes, also the police expert, uh, were interested in and, and commented on our proposals. So we'll wait and see when they actually draft the report whether the use of criminal intelligence led policing, and, and as Chris said, there, there's a growing acceptance of the need. And I think clearly the fact that there is violent extremism, that the UN does confront that threat, they know they have to use intelligence. But let's use it then to solve the problem. Let's use it to identify the people who are actually committing actions against the mission and holding them accountable. Again, that's back to the hybrid justice institutions. So you see those two obviously need to go together. So Chris has the recommendations that we've prepared in the book. So it's on the website. I'm looking forward to your questions and help, help me refine these ideas but if they do resonate with you, I'd really like to find a way to work together so that we can get them into use. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, David. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as was mentioned in my introduction, um, I work with global communities. We're an international NGO um, working in international development. Uh, and humanitarian assistance, and so we uh, engage in a broad array of activities and sectors from economic development to agriculture, health, countering violent extremism, governance, financial inclusion, uh, and of course humanitarian assistance. And uh, in terms of the latter, uh, we are on the ground uh, currently working in northern Syria and in Lebanon and in Jordan. Uh, but before I get into sort of our specific approach uh, and our focus on really early recovery and resilience, uh, let me 
just give a little context by throwing up some some numbers at you. Um, there are currently over 12 million people in need of humanitarian assistance. Inside Syria, there are over 7.5 million people that are internally displaced, uh, the vast majority of which are in Aleppo, Idlib, and the rural Damascus uh, governorates. Uh, 4.8 million people are living in besieged or harder to reach areas. And then, of course, there's the close to 4 million uh, registered Syrian refugees. Uh, while the needs vary greatly from one community to another, the most urgent priority needs are uh, pretty much what you would expect, uh, emergency or temporary shelter, medical care and supplies, food and education. Uh, but there have been a lot of discussion and mention in, by some of the earlier panelists about sort of all of the funding constraints and uh, the difficulty that that presents. And just to give that a little bit of context, uh, as a humanitarian assistance organization, we have uh, responded to a lot of different humanitarian crises, both natural and man-made. Uh, earthquake in Haiti, uh, Ebola response in Liberia, um, Colombia, war in Gaza, now we've got the earthquake in Nepal. Many of these are happening simultaneously, and this has been an unprecedented uh, year, more than a year now. Uh, just in terms of the, the, the number of severe humanitarian crises, in any one crisis, the uh, constraints with funding are always really tough. But now when you've got so many coming you know, at the same time, the, the coffers are getting depleted pretty quickly and it's hard to, uh, to keep going back to the well and finding even with a very generous public, but to find ways to get those coffers filled. That's a huge constraint. Um, and I mentioned those numbers in terms of the millions of people affected by the war in, Syri in Syria, because when you look at some of these other crises, whether it was an earthquake in Haiti in 2010, or, or uh, Ebola in, in West Africa, there you're talking about numbers of a couple hundred thousand, or case of Ebola, 10,000 people. Uh, here we're talking in, in the millions. Um, I think that for most Americans, the traditional image of humanitarian uh, assistance or humanitarian response, what you typically think of and see on your TV screen is maybe a truck with somebody standing on the back of the truck throwing out bags of food and bottles of water and a horde of people behind it with their hands outstretched trying to grab whatever they can catch, um, or what humanitarian workers call truck and chuck. Um, we, we have brought some trucks of supplies into Syria, but uh, the real focus of our approach um, is different. We're focusing on early recovery and uh, on resilience as a means of complementing uh, what a lot of our other NGO partners and, and people that we're working with side by side are doing in terms of the most immediate emergency humanitarian needs. Uh, you know, Chris Holshut referred earlier to the difficulty of getting from, uh, you know, the immediate uh, response right after a crisis begins into a recovery phase. And it is a difficult one, but the, the view that we take and the approach that we take at local communities is that we think the time to really begin preparation for the early recovery is at the immediate stage. It is uh, at the early stage of the crisis um, and in the midst of the crisis. Uh, so even in the midst of the turmoil and the, you know, the reason for that is even in the midst of all the turmoil and the conflict, I mean, daily life does go on, even if it's in kind of a mangled, skewed reality for the people who live there. Uh, and so our approach is, uh, at the core, is to help people have their lives go on um, and partnering with them to help them help themselves. Um, displaced people, and this is particularly true in, in, inside of Syria, uh, are often displaced not just once, but multiple times um, as the conflict uh, evolves. And so we try to 
uh, meet people's basic, basic needs, but also ensure, ensure that as we do that, they're better prepared for the next time they're displaced. Um, livelihoods change for people change in conflict situations. So uh, uh, a farmer who's fled from his rural farm to an urban area, uh, what's he going to do? Um, we have to prepare people for ways of, of feeding themselves and their families in that kind of a situation. Um, for communities on the ground, the term we use for that is resilience. Um, it's a big buzzword now in international development, but it's, uh, I think it's a very relevant term for that kind of work. Um, so, to give you an example of what we're doing in northern Syria more specifically, and it's just one example, um, we're trying to address uh, the issue of food insecurity. A brutal civil war has resulted in over half of the population becoming food insecure, uh, meaning they don't have access to food to meet their family's nutritional needs. Um, and so we're working to try to address that food insecurity, uh, working with other agencies as well by providing seeds to people um, so that they can grow their own food. Uh, and we accompany that by, by training so that households can maximize the nutritional value that they get from the food that they're growing, ensure that they know how to, uh, to care for these small little pots of, you know, where they can grow some crops. So if you think of, of the displacement, you know, as, a, as an urban dweller may be displaced to a rural area, we can provide them with a, with a seed kit where they can have a little pot of land and, and have a garden and grow some food. Um, and likewise, as a rural farmer comes to and you know, is displaced to an urban area, again, we can provide them with a seed kit and they can have a little urban garden. Uh, we've done that in the past in places like Gaza after three wars now um, and found it's been quite successful. Um, in terms of how we're doing this, we do it, we can't send our own people directly into Syria, so we are partnering with local Syrian NGOs. Um, obviously that uh, requires a very careful, carefully vetted process, a selection process, um, and we use a number of different you know, tools and methodologies um, to manage those programs and the partnerships we have with the local Syrian NGOs uh, remotely. So we have an office in Gaziantep in southern Turkey, and it's it's sort of a remote control operation. We rely a lot on mobile technology um, as, as a primary tool, but we're in, in constant contact. We, we know these NGOs, we work with them, um, and they've, we, we only work with ones that we have vetted, not only in terms of ensuring that the people are who they say they are, but even equally important that they have the right financial controls, that they have the capacity um, to do what they need to do. Um, so I mention that in part because that piece alone is also a part of resilience because it's helping to build Syrian civil society. Um, outside of Syria, uh, uh, of course, there's been lots of talk earlier on the earlier panels about uh, the refugee crisis, um, and we're, we have a presence in both Lebanon and Jordan, um, assisting, assisting both refugees and host, host communities, and we believe very strongly that you can't just do one and not the other. Um, so uh, to, to keep a focus on resilience, it's critically important in our view that the local communities have to be supported and have to be empowered in a way that they can meet their own needs. Uh, if you look at Lebanon, uh, one third of the population now is comprised of Syrian refugees. Um, and they're not in camps. They're embedded into the, you know, dispersed throughout the country, embedded into the local communities, usually in lower income areas. Uh, and, you know, on top of that, if you look at, you know, prior to the, the Syrian uh, crisis, uh, Lebanon already had a large number of refugees, Palestinian refugees. Uh, I think uh, Shelley Pitterman said uh, early this afternoon that uh, most refugees don't return to their home countries 
until I was 17 years. Um, many, many don't ever return. Uh, many Syrian refugees, I mean, many refugees, and including will include the Syrians, will end up staying um, outside of their home country. Um, and so you're looking at, you know, really at changing the demographics of the region. Um, within Lebanese society, you know, we, we've been working there for 20 years uh, in more traditional kinds of development programs as well as humanitarian assistance. And I can tell you our staff on the ground, um, who are almost entirely themselves Lebanese, but we hear a lot about kind of the, the increasing impatience, uh, the loss of tolerance that people are having in their communities because the communities are just so strained. Uh, the services are so stra strained and stretched, um, and there's just a shortage of resources, and of course there's also always the jobs issue. Um, Syrians are exceedingly um, entrepreneurial people. Um, I've, I've been in Jordan and heard Jordanian small business owners say, I would fire one of my Jordanian employees and replace them with a Syrian because the Syrians are more entrepreneurial. You know, that creates, creates a lot of stresses and strains. Um, so in Lebanon, we get a lot of support from funding support from UNHCR um, and where we've been helping host families um, to upgrade and expand their homes um, so that they have a greater capacity to take in um, Syrian refugees into their communities. Um, and I'll, I think I'll try to come back to that in a moment. But uh, there is, you know, in terms of a, a long-term shift we're looking at here, uh, I mentioned a third of the population in Lebanon is now Syrian. Um, over 400,000 people in the country were already Palestinians who were living in refugee camps. Um, and, you know, it's, it's again, it, these are people that are likely to stay permanently. Um, and so we're very focused in these host communities. Um, we, had a, we have a, a program in Jordan uh, that's funded by USAID, which is a huge program where we're working it's called the Community Engagement Program. It started actually as a program to assist the local Jordanian communities that were being uh, negatively impacted economically, socially, uh, politically by the influx of refugees. And Jordan, unlike Lebanon, is a place where the Syrian ref refugees are going into camps initially, but they pretty quickly, many of them very quickly find a way out of the camps and into the local communities. So what we're doing in Jordan is we started just working with the Jordanian communities and it very quickly uh, expanded to including working directly with the Syrian refugees as well. Um, and it's kind of working across a panoply of, of areas, but in our basic approach, uh, we're creating um, sort of the foundation of the program is creating what we call community enhan enhancement teams. These are basically local councils that are elected uh, by the citizens in the community and are elected to uh, identify all the various pressure points in the community, uh, the points that are under stress because of the big influx of the refugees. And once they identify all those problems, we, global communities, are kind of in the center acting primarily as a catalyst, trying to put the community councils together with their local municipal governments. Um, here are the priorities, here are the services that you and the municipal governments need to be providing, and we'll assist uh, both sides in that effort, um, with both funding and with technical assistance and training and so on. And so the kinds of things that they've been doing, um, it's been kind of community-led uh, cleanup efforts, a lot of trash piles up in these communities. Uh, so it's, it's cleaning up the trash, it's building parks, clinics, um, expanding schools, creating daycare centers, really trying to get at as many of the different areas that are being stressed by the influx of refugees as we can. I think more 
importantly than those aspects we are addressing a specific need is what happens over a period of months once you start working at the, at the community level with these community enhancement teams in the way that we've been doing. It, it, it begins to build trust. Trust between the people in the community and the refugees who have come into the community. Trust between the community and the local government. Um, trust between us and the community, us as the outsiders. Um, and we see that in Lebanon, we've seen it in, in Jordan. Um, and that, I think, you know, kind of going to the point that I think Chris kind of ended on in the last panel is we don't call it peace building. We're not a peace building organization. That's not our mission. We're an international development organization. But when you take an approach to humanitarian assistance and international development um, in that manner at the community level, and you do build that kind of trust, you do build the resilience, um, you're empowering the communities. And I think when you empower the communities, you're really setting the stage for, uh, for when the conflict ends. Uh, we're not going to be able to end the conflict. Uh, I think history is replete with examples of uh, peace agreements that have been signed and then you know the truce gets pretty quickly violated or you know there's skirmishes that still break out, outbreaks of violence. Um, it has to, anything that happens at the international or national level really needs the bottom-up community level grassroots kind of uh, empowerment from the communities to make it work. Um, and so that again is kind of an underpinning of, of why we take the approach to humanitarian assistance that we do. Thank you. Um, before we go to questions, <clears throat> I'd like to think since this is the last panel that what we covered were both strategic and tactical. We dealt with private sector governments as well as um, uh, the role for the international organizations. Uh, keywords, um, bottom up, um, confidence building, resilience, accountability, information, and of course, always, where, what is your funding source? And if I'm thinking of, I was just doing a calculation in my head, knowing how much it costs to feed a thousand people in, a, in any particular situation, even when you have good prices. Um, if you have 12 million people that need some form of food assistance and water assistance, especially in those areas, in the Middle East, water is also at a premium per day. I think you're talking about per week, probably pretty seven days in a week, pretty close to about a hundred billion dollars. So you think that's a low figure, David? Oh uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a low figure. Uh, when I think of what we could do with a hundred million dollars, uh, we can <laughs> we can make a dollar stretch pretty far. Yeah, but. I think, you know, again, I mean, the, it's, it's the magnitude of it, of the whole situation. It's going to take many, many, many billions of dollars. And, you know, that's before you even think about what it's going to be if the war, you know, and the war will end at some point, it might be not next year, but maybe it's five years or ten years, but the war in Syria will end. If you think about what the rebuilding process will be alone. You're re referencing just the cost, maybe, of food and water and, and basic supplies, shelter. the really basic stuff. When yeah. you get into to shelter and more expensive things like that, it's huge. Yeah, and in terms of accountability, you're talking about having to coordinate uh, between local people, ultimately some form of either regional if there's no national governance and intermediaries 
Fed could step in to help to form these kind of hybrid interim justice and law enforcement systems. And do you think, you know, in, in this regard, that it's more an issue, well, money does come into it because you have to build out the structure. But, but besides money, what, what, what is the key component, the key, the key element that you would add to that? Yeah, actually, I, you're right. It doesn't come totally cost-free. However, uh, the UN does have a funding mechanism, a way of funding peace missions, so we don't need a new source of funding. And uh, when you look at how much the mission in the DRC costs you now after, what, 17 years, uh, if we can actually get it right at the beginning, I, and I failed to mention this, and maybe this is important, the answer to the question we talked about information, properly assessing the situation and is the government itself part of the problem or part of the solution? Sometimes it is part of the solution. So, but if it isn't and you don't realize it and then you intervene, you, the mission could end up suffering uh, <laughs> calamities. However, it'll take years to figure it out. And then Several years later, you get the mandate to actually get started. So you've wasted two or three years and, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. However, a few judges, and you know, it's in the handful of millions, which is funded by assessments. Um, but using police to conduct, you know, criminally intelligence like policing is just doing it smarter. It's not costing you any more money. You've got police that you have to recruit the right people. So I think most of the things that need to be done, in my case, don't require more money. Uh, they don't require any new funding streams. They just require us to do it smarter. Uh, and, and one other element of that that I've seen in working in certain situations is that you need to have somebody backing you that the local power structure is going to pay attention to. If you don't have what you know, Big Louie from the Bronx behind you that will lay down the law, that that you know your back is covered politically, as well as in terms of your life is threatened, then you fail. So in all of these circumstances, it's like what David said: you start from the beginning, or you lose time, you waste a lot, and a lot of people die. It's also strategically and politically on that same level. If we don't have someone, like if I look at places like Afghanistan during the 90s, which I was very involved in, there were certain people the UN kept sending no one respected. And they were great in front of the camera, they looked distinguished, but no one was afraid of them. And when you're dealing with very bad people, it's not that you're a bully, but you need someone that they know is not going to take uh, for us. They'll just act with impunity. So this balance between security and humanitarian development, resilience, it's, you know, everything has its place. And a lot of times there's one or two elements missing, and it leads to failure. Same thing happened with Vincent in Cambodia. You can go down the line. Mm -hmm. Middle East is, like, really incredible with all the, di the diver diverse of forces that are there. But it's also things that when we're looking at this and planning and operating that are absolutely essential that often are missing ingredients. Mm -hmm. So I'll open this up to questions now and comments. Uh, we'll start in front. Uh, I'd like to address uh, Ralph Krauss, uh, the United Nations Association, the National Capital Area. Um, I have a question regarding uh, who should decide is uh, the CPS, the, your criminalized power structure. Uh, we, we have the separation of powers, domestic law, and due process means that the same person that uh, the policeman who arrests you isn't not the one who uh, decides that you are guilty, nor decides who how you should be punished. But in the war on terror that we've witnessed, the, uh, they say someone's a bad guy and when they go after him and they might take some innocent people besides. So how do you, uh, is it the International Criminal Court? 
Well, it, the way that's a really critical question because <laughs> I wouldn't go around branding one group or another as a criminalized power structure. That's not going to get you anywhere. They brand themselves for the conduct. And so the mandate crimes would be well, protect, your, your mandate is to protect civilians. Whoever was responsible for ki killing their political rival, but whoever was the perpetrator of the murder or the assault or whatever intimidation, or trying to suborn a member of the UN staff. They have identified themselves by their criminal behavior as being, you know, I wouldn't brand them with criminalized power structure, but that's what's going on. So by their conduct, by the crimes that they commit, they then, of course, what we need to do is not just go after the first person who commits a crime. We need to gather the intelligence. Understand. In fact, you raise an issue uh, by your question. But do there are people we can't go after. Yeah, my experience was in Kosovo with Chris. Uh, we couldn't go after Thatchi or Mushardini. You know, the people, KLA leaders, who were involved in criminal activity, but they were our primary interlocutors. So we couldn't go arrest them. However, if you understand the network, who their key enablers are. You can dismantle the structure, and you're sending a signal to them, look, either clean up your act, or we can create consequences for you. So that goes a little bit beyond your question, but they determine by their behavior, by committing the crimes, the mandate crimes, that they are a criminal process. Is there a separation of powers? Well, the uh, police might think you've done the crime, but uh, whether or not, but the person may think he's really uh, yeah, yeah. So not it's guilty. A the, actually, this, there needs to be a, talking about cooperate a strategy for coordinated and cooperated, you know, co coordination and cooperation. Obviously, you've got to bring the political leader, the SRSG, together with the force commander and the police commissioner and whoever's providing the intel. But to make the decision, it's a political decision. Who to go after? It's not some policeman. Going well, out and making an arrest. Justice system come into play. Well, so the, the justice system. We're talking about creating a an entity that did not exist before by identifying trustworthy judges and prosecutors and police to work with in collaboration with the international community. But those very interesting issues in terms of accountability. There's some problems that arise. The separation of powers. The separation of powers problem that arises is that in Kosovo, judges and prosecutors want six month tours. If they didn't go after the person that the SRSD wanted them to go after or deliver the outcome, they might find that their contract wasn't read. That's not, you know, there needs to be a separation of powers so that the international judges and prosecutors, in a sense, have a way of determining who within them is engaging in this climate. That's a very important issue. Uh, Joel. Yeah. Uh, Joel Coulter, Mobile Sciences Consortium. We recently set up a program with Post Nation Perspectives where we have border security, <coughs> maritime security with capacity building in the local community. In fact, we encourage State Department so I can access surplus military equipment and get businesses repurposing that equipment. But when you go into USAID and you go into other places to try to get funding, what seems to be the, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of the funding goes to keep the status quo of the major organizations who want to do the global thing, not the local thing. And I, I value accountability, I value evaluation and monitoring, and you could build this massive centralized, top-down, with all the technology we have, the sensors and UAVs, the question is, how do we shift the priorities, other than giving the people in the local a checkbook so they can write their own checks, how do we shift the money from the centralized top-down to the localized empowerment and encouragement? Yeah, that, that's a, that is a core issue. Uh, because we don't get any funds from U.S. government. I, I don't feel threatened by anyone. You know, I can say things that, who cares? Yeah, right. You know, they're not going to take anything away that you don't have. 
Um, but that's always an issue. And um, this is where I think there is really a need for the private sector to be able to help by in a certain way where you're targeting specific things that can make a difference. I know that State Department, USAID, the UN and others are trying to encourage private sector um, to be a little more involved because always within any government system there, you know, there are things that are ways by which government, they, they, familiarity, people they feel they know and that they can trust, that know the system, it's just, it's inevitable. Um, but I would like to see at some point if there was more of a role for the private sector to be able to help to facilitate these things that are a little bit out of the box and that could become systematized. Um, what do you think, David? Well, there's, there's certainly a role for the private sector, and the role has been um, increasing dramatically. Um, you know, everybody wants to do public-private partnerships these days, including USAID, um, but they do they do prove to be pretty effective. And humanitarian assistance, uh, yeah, it's amazing what the private sector does to help. I mean, you, we have you know partners like UPS, for example, who will put up cargo planes to you know free of cost, and they'll go to the humanitarian NGOs uh, who are trying to get supplies out medical supplies, food supplies, and so on, and, you know, as long as you can, as the NGOs can work together as a community so that when they're taking advantage of the offer, they're actually really loading up a cargo bay of a big, you know, UPS plane, uh, they'll do it. Uh, but, you know, in, in the more sort of traditional development work, too, where, I mean, we work a lot more with the private sector now than we ever have before. Um, I think the private sector recognizes um, the value of themselves, not just giving back to their to communities, whether it's here or internationally, as a um, you know, as kind of nice window dressing that makes them look good. But I think they recognize the strategic value these days, and increasingly, you don't see separate sort of corporate social responsibility departments, but it really becomes a part of. It. Corporate strategy. I think to your other point, though, about about USAID, um, you know, we've seen an evolution of USAID policies. We're not by any means exclusively funded by USAID, but we do get a lot of funding from them. Um, there's always with every administration, like everything, you know, that people come in and they there's a tendency to reinvent the wheel a bit. Uh, but there's uh, been a big move within the international development community, including USAID, to sort of go local. So with, with USAID, uh, a few years back, you know, they set a policy for 30% of their funding to go directly to local governments, local NGOs, local private sector. Uh, and it was with very mixed results because, you know, they also want very high standards of compliance. Um, and financial accountability and people to be good stewards of donor money um, and there's not the capacity there and I think you know I've got a lot of self-serving interest here but in the NGO community we believe that that's the role that we most effectively play we want to see things go local too but the capacity building piece is the most critical part of it and that's in many ways what we're all about and one thing I would just say is that there are IG reports that have been ignored. And IG reports should be taken seriously and people shouldn't be fired, as it's happened in the Pentagon as well as in the State Department, for someone trying to do an honest evaluation and assessment. So I think if we had our any members of Congress or people working in Congress, that, there, that Congress needs to do its due diligence also and make sure that those who do accurate and courageous reporting for the Inspector General's office should not lose their jobs because of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. David, first of all, you, first of all, what the organization is doing in Syria. However, 
I'm quite curious. Uh, the White House administration, or this administration, has been very rejecting to do any aid towards Syria and the capacity of the humanitarian, and as well to the aspect of military assistance uh, because of the Assad regime. How difficult has it been for your organization being to be able to succeed in sending for humanitarian aid to the Syria? Well, we're not, uh, we don't work in any areas that are controlled by the Assad regime. Um, so that's, that's a constraining factor, certainly, uh, in terms of how many people in need can be reached. Um, but we, you know, in the areas where we can work, we also have to be very careful about who's controlling those areas. Um, so we have, uh, we work under, we, not just us, but the, the NGO humanitarian community works under a set of operating principles. Um, in terms of what we won't uh, do if asked by whatever group is controlling an area that we're working in. Uh, there are many areas that we can't get into at all, regardless of who's controlling it, because it's just the security constraints are, are way too severe. I'm not sure if this is really answering your question, but, but I think bottom line, we, don't, we do not... Uh, and nor would our donors allow us to work in the Assad regime controlled areas. Yes. Um, just one little question. But with, with, your, with the kind of interest that you have, who's creating the picture of right whenever you go into a country, whether it be Syria or wherever, where the picture of right equals the government structure itself is working the way we need it to be working? whether it's agriculture or transportation or whatever, so that whenever you start providing, in your case, aid, in your case, policing, um, law enforcement kind of stuff, that, that it's actually happening um, the way it's supposed to be happening. And the reason I ask that question is just in Afghanistan alone, uh, General Masters and I and, and a few of the others that we put the estimates on this call up with Sadat, about $6.1 billion in cash went out of the side of Afghanistan each year for probably about the last eight or nine years. So what that means to some people like me who spend a lot of time checking that stuff is that whatever it is that you're doing, or we're doing, or people that you know are doing, <clears throat> was going in a completely unaccountable fashion. Then we put together the networks for bad guys that were taking money. And we had a government structure that wasn't supporting them through the Attorney General's office and the presence to be able to do any prosecutions. So now you're dealing with, before you even go in, who's looking at the picture of right to say it's the right thing to do? It, or go in with, like you say, are you going to go in with an outside entity? Well, here's the thing. When things are politicized, I was working in Afghanistan um, in the Congress for the Chairman of International Relations from the time bin Laden went back from Africa, watched the Taliban reform, tried to understand their psychology and understand the way the Pakistanis and the Saudis were supporting them. We had a meeting in the White House, I'm not going to mention any names, um, where the UN, this is one thing, as much as I can complain about the UN, they did, that Pino Orlacci did well as the person that was responsible for narcotics policy at the UN. Brought us satellite pictures, declassified, of the drug warehouses, the opium warehouses, near Baluchistan in the area, tri-border area, if you consider Baluchistan to be an independent entity. Um, and we brought it to the White House, because we knew they weren't paying attention. We said, this is their World Trade Center. This would have been in 2000. Three, right before the bombing started, forgive me, uh, September, still, probably October, right at, a month after, and uh, we were briefing National Security Council with those pictures. There were three of us from the IR committee, including one congressman, retired FBI, and myself, 
And we said, this is their World Trade Center. If you want to hurt them and you want to shut them down, the first bombing raid should be to take out all of this area. But you then you defund them. The person looked at me and said, we can't do that. Now, Don Rumsfeld would have said we can't do it because our, that's DEA's job, it's not our job, we don't want to be involved in, in drugs. The other person said, and it wasn't Tom Lucerus, but it was somebody she put in charge, we can't do that because it would undermine Karzai. That was the exact stinking quote. So everything that you all had to deal with afterwards it was based on that and other things, but that's what I meant before with the issue of it's difficult if you have people to feel that the the ones who are disrupting, the corrupt people, the bad people that you're talking about are protected by international government. Hmm. And we could not have, I resigned from government shortly thereafter because I felt we were going to lose because when you're supporting criminals, you can't win. We had an ambassador that I was in a meeting with, who I won't be, that said that the reason that we're not going after the narcotics operations at the senior levels, chasing the $100 million um, pieces going across the borders, was because it would put too many Afghans out of work and if they on the race would rise. So I got it. Yeah. So, but having said that, that point you now you've got the, you know, you've got the local kind of pieces that are also going on. And how do you deal with, with the pictures of right inside of the circles where we're a lot of work inside of um, whenever they put us there, how do you deal with how do you deal with those structures, those governmental structures that just aren't functioning? Agriculture is not working where the dag on. Transportation is not working where, the, let alone law enforcement and their military <coughs> structures. So how do you how do you work inside of that kind of environment? You can't able to get to a picture of right. You can't. And you saw that recently they defunded the major NGO that they had given so much money to to do agriculture, but tragically. They ignored IG reports and they did it years after, after the system was already broken. And this, this right. is not what you think. No, it, that is the point. We created that regime, you know, the bond settlement, and we told Karzai, look, look the other way. He brought the warlords in to the government, and the trade off was you don't use violence to obtain power, and you get to reap the rewards of looting the national treasury, and you have a punitive. That was the system we set up. Why? Because we wanted them to fight the Taliban. That's the regime we created. We, we created. And now we see, it was 10 years later when they set up Task Force South Shabafia, but it was too late. So, yeah. you know, if you wait 10 years to try to establish accountability, it's fool's error. And we did the same thing with Maliki. You know, how, how, why did the Islamic State win? <laughs> the, 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 the military force that we created had been hollowed out by replacing professionals with his own loyalists and the go soldiers. And it was because there was no accountability. So anyway, it, trying to do it, well, you need to start at the beginning. That's my point. Make capacity building and accountability equal primacy. And the picture yeah. of right people is that? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's no. what you mean. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's all about being accountable to yourself. Yes. I mean, if you're talking well, about Democratic governments that are supposed to be democratic, you have to be accountable because that's where it starts. And if we lose our own sense of accountability, we can't expect no matter how many billions we spend, nothing good will come of it, ultimately. Yes, Chris? If, if, you, if you will, and this is my own experiences too, and I know you have a lot, is that if the accountability and transparency it is towards the big man. Yeah. Okay. The the, the Louis from the Bronx. Big Louis from, big Louis from the Bronx. <laughs> then then you're he's the mafia guy, so you're empowering the criminal structures. What I kept trying to do in, in, in when I was a civil affairs guy was to, to revert the security structures, the community governance structures to being accountable to the community. Yes. And the community will call them to task because there's a vested interest there. Okay? And you create that relationship and you create that power and you've just empowered that community and you've and you've held those guys in in check. And no matter what the hell's going on in Baghdad, 
you're building governance down in Tikar province. Now, Chris, one of the things that I did in a very difficult part of the southern Philippines is I used the schools as the economic center because you start to build accountability when you have everybody's kid. And, and what I did, unlike three cups of tea, I defied the criminal warlords to steal from their own kids. Because that was the only place there was transparency because everybody from the community, no matter what clan, no matter what family, whether they had power or no power, their kids were in that school. And so it would defy the local officials. Go ahead and steal from your own kid. I'm not giving you a damn penny. And you can threaten me all you want, but you're not getting a centavo. But I'll give it to your, your kid's teacher. Do you have a problem with that? Oh, no, no, no. Because they would not want to be seen as stealing from their own kid. And, I mean, there's different ways. Other places, Matt's I'm sure David cold. has moments, I'm sure that we, everybody in this room that does field work, we can name the country or a situation where we've had to adapt to the culture as best we could and create accountability systems. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Do we get death threats? Yes, we get death threats. And you have to be able to stand up to the devil, look the devil in the eye, and you better hope those parents at that school are going to form a circle around you. Mm. So when the devil comes for you, he's going to have to go through his own people and then might lose his power and think twice about it. That's not Big Louie, that's democracy. Mm -hmm. But without calling it that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the one that's saying no, that. that some, <laughs> sometimes you fight fire with fire, even us sweet humanitarians, but other times it's the community that matters. And if we believe in some semblance of civil society, we won't even call it democracy, because democracy has a bad name in too many places, not because of corruption. But we'll just say civil society, where there is accountability. Going back to the very beginning of this discussion today, if the antidote to, to the, is, is governance in that larger sense, in civil society, that is community-based, and you build it from the bottom up, not from the top down, because, because and Afghanistan is a perfect example, you know, four million, X million dollars into the Ministry of Agriculture, how much of that actually trickled down? I mean, think about it, it's trickled down theory. How, how, how's that, how well has that worked for us? You know, mm -hmm. here, I mean, I'm not trying to get partisan or anything, but it, it hasn't, okay? Well, it's, it's land a, It's a bad also, model. Chris. It's land, yeah. it's land ownership. Ownership. And it's land, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you have all these people coming back from Pakistan and Iraq. And their land has been stolen from them by big We don't want to make them look bad. Yeah. So accountability starts at home. Yes. Well, if I could, Al, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is, we have a, a networking social uh, to immediately follow. We have our friends uh, here from the Syrian American Council. Uh, and the reason we're having this networking social uh, is so we can continue this discussion. And I think uh, we can all agree that this is a very challenging uh, discussion. You know, we could probably host another day uh, uh, focused on private sector investments, you know, where we, we actually have thought about that idea for a follow-on form. This is our second uh, roundtable within our Peace and Security Committee, uh, and we really would like to hear from organizations like the UN Procurement Office, uh, which could actually help companies and private sector organizations better understand how to get themselves involved. Uh, but bringing this whole form back into perspective, uh, it's on that poster board uh, when, when we go into the networking social, and that is uh, the refugees. I made a bunch of points, but we're running out of time. Uh, but there, I do want to bring up one point, and, and that was uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Fetterman saying he's afraid that people will see the risk of refugees uh, as the problem. And, and it's very important to note, uh, it's the instability of where the refugees are living. And that is what we're trying to prevent. And that is why we're not, we're the Peace and Security Committee, uh, but we're really focused on peace building. Uh, and even before that, when you look at it from a, a Jordanian embassy perspective, it's economic development. It's a camp, Zatari, going from uh, the conversion of a camp, a refugee camp, to the city of Zatari. 
which is the third largest next to Oman. They need a city planner. You mentioned the global strategy. There is no utopian vision. Nobody's going to have a plan that is going to, that is going to solve every problem. But I didn't know that there was a Syrian refugee uh, migration flow in Greece. So when the European Union is looking at Greece, are they talking to the UN and saying, hey, are you accounting for your planning for your increase in your population of Syrian refugees in Greece? In Greece right now, as we know their situation financially, they're, not go they're, they're going to have problems. And you mentioned Big Blue, I just had to bring this comment, you must have been reading my mind. I looked up the uh, city of New York's operating budget, <laughs> $78.3 what is it, 11 million people? That's 7 billion for every million. Imagine Leesburg, Virginia, 1.2 million refugees alone just in Jordan. Imagine, what is it, 11 total, 13 million total refugees in one area like Leesburg, Virginia. What would that do to Washington, D.C.? What would that do to Baltimore? If you, if you look at those kind of scenarios, now you understand what is really going on in the Middle East. It's easy here to watch CNN, see a headline, and, and, and look at it from our perspective. When you look at the infrastructure and the services and all that money that's going in for every million in New York, right? Looks pretty easy. But these are people that can't even turn on their electricity. And, and, and uh, organizations like Global Communities, uh, thank you, uh, David, as well. Um, we contacted two uh, corporations or other organizations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and Citigroup uh, International. We learned that Citigroup has a country officer you know, in every bordering country that we've discussed today. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they have some humanitarian affairs efforts, uh, but they're more focused you know, on, on that, that, that part of the sector. You know, versus Joel, you mentioned technology. Well, like the UN, well, excuse me. The UN uh, it has actually started an initiative where they're developing technology banks. Uh, so we can talk offline about that. You know, but, it, but it's those types of initiatives that feed into this overall grand uh, you know, global strategy. And we need to emphasize post-2015 agenda. And now is the time. Six months ago, Fairfax, Virginia, there was a high-level panel for state-building, peace-building goals. And it's those types of venues you know, that we can start interjecting. I, I like the idea. I, I really do. Uh, but those are just some points, and in, in as we've done uh, at our first round table at George Mason University, which actually uh, developed a recommendation, which, Al, you were also a part of that. Uh, that is why we're here. And, and we'd like to continue this with a third annual round table and, 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 and so on. Um, but before uh, we close, I do have some materials. Uh, USAID that's come up uh, gives you kind of a snapshot. Before I uh, arrived here, I actually came from the World Bank. Uh, they were also invited uh, there at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, and I asked you know, if I could express their apologies. <laughs> they said yes. Uh, they had a, a representative that, that they were going to have here, you know, explain all of, of what is going on in the bordering areas of, of Syria, uh, specifically in the, in the refugee uh, crisis. And right now they're kind of in a standstill with, with Syria. Uh, but there's a handout that they put together for May, updated May 2015, so feel free to grab all those materials. But most importantly, there are several thank yous. And uh, first of all, uh, Chris, a uh, co-chair, uh, you know, we've, we've planned a lot and we've done a lot, um, but as a moderator, thank you. Uh, Don uh, Calabia, uh, you know, I think she may have left early, uh, but thanks to her uh, for moderating the first panel. And of course, Al, uh, yourself, thank you for, for moderating, moderating this panel. Uh, other people that deserve uh, absolute recognition, uh, Ms. Paula Bowen, she's our executive director uh, for the UNANCA. Uh, we have uh, Ashley Ryan, uh, she helped organize a lot of this, and uh, Katie Bridges, uh, she's here at the Institute of World Politics, which I'd also like to thank the Institute, and Al, as you know, you have a new certificate program, the Peace Building, what is it, Stabilization Humanitarian Affairs uh, Program, uh, so this is very timely to have this form uh, here, and then uh, we have, of course, our members of the UNANCA, you know, thank you to, to all of you. So now uh, we can close this warm. It's been a, a wonderful day, uh, and thank you for taking your time. Uh, Christina Hansen, she is the chair. 
right there uh, for the Human Rights Committee, and will be joined with the uh, Syrian American Council. So thank you all. Thank you.